His daddy told him I'm trash. My mama trash before me. His brother say the same. Albert try to stand up for us, get knocked down. One reason they give him for not marrying me is cause I have children. But they his, I told old mister. How us know that? he asked. Poor Annie Julia, Shook say. She never had a chance. I was so mean and so wild, Lord. I used to go around saying, I don't care who he married to, I'm going to fuck him. She stopped talking a minute. Then she say, and I did too. Us fuck so much in the open, us give fucking a bad name. But he fuck Anna Julia too, she say, and she didn't have nothing, not even a liking for him. Her family forgot about her once she married. And then Harpo and all the children start to come. Finally, she started to sleep with that man that shot her down. Albert beat her. The cheering dragged on her. Sometimes I wonder what she thought about while she died. I know what I'm thinking about, I think. Nothing. And as much of it as I can. I went to school with Aunt Julia, Shug say. She was pretty man black as anything, and skin just as smooth. Big black eyes look like moons, and sweet, too. Hell, says Shug, I liked her myself. Why I hurt her so? I used to keep Albert away from home for a week at the time. She'd come and beg him for money to buy groceries for the children. I feel a few drops of water on my hand. And when I come here, says Shug, I treated you so mean, like you was a servant. And all because Albert married you, and I didn't even want him for a husband, she say. I never really wanted Albert for a husband, but just to choose me, you know, because nature had already done it. Nature said, you two folks, hook up, because you're a good example of how it's supposed to go. I didn't want nothing to be able to go against that. But what was good between us must have been nothing but bodies, she say. Because I don't know the Albert that don't dance, can't hardly laugh, never talk about nothing, beat you and hid your sister Nettie's letters. Who he? I don't know nothing, I think, and glad of it. Dear God, now that I know Albert hiding in Nettie's letters, I know exactly where they is. They're in his trunk. Everything that means something to Albert go in his trunk. He keep it locked up tight, but Suge can get the key. One night, when Mr. and Grady gone, us open the trunk. Us find a lot of Suge's underclothes, some nasty picture postcards, and way down under his tobacco, Nettie's letters. Bunches and bunches of them. Some fat, some thin, some open, some not. How is going to do this? I asked Shug. She say, simple. We take the letters out of the envelopes, leave the envelopes just like they is. I don't think he look in this corner of the trunk much, she say. I heated the stove, put on the kettle. Us steam and steam the envelopes until we had all the letters laying on the table. Then us put the envelopes back inside the trunk. I'm going to put them in some kind of order for you, say Shug. Yeah, I say, but don't let's do it in here. Let's go in you and Grady room. So she got up and us went into their little room. Shug sat in a chair by the bed with all Nettie letters spread round her. I got on the bed with the pillows behind my back. These the first ones, says Shug. They postmark right here. Dear Seely, the first letter say, You got to fight and get away from Albert. He ain't no good. When I left you all's house, walking, he followed me on his horse. When we was well out of sight of the house, 
he caught up with me and started trying to talk. You know how he do. You sure is looking fine, Miss Nettie, and stuff like that. I tried to ignore him and walk faster, but my bundles was heavy and the sun was hot. After a while I had to rest, and that's when he got down from his horse and started to try to kiss me and drag me back in the woods. Well, I started to fight him, and with God's help, I heard him bad enough to make him let me alone, but he was some mad. He said because of what I'd done, I'd never hear from you again, and you would never hear from me. I was so mad myself, I was shaking. Anyhow, I got a ride into town on somebody's wagon, and that same somebody pointed me in the direction of the Reverend Mister's place. And what was my surprise when a little girl opened the door, and she had your eyes set in your face. Love, Nettie. Next one said, Dear Celie, I keep thinking it's too soon to look for a letter from you, and I know how busy you is with all Mister's children, but I miss you so much. Please write to me soon as you have a chance. Every day I think about you, every minute. The lady you met in town is named Corinne. The little girl's name is Olivia. The husband's name is Samuel. The little boy's name is Adam. They are sanctified, religious, and very good to me. They live in a nice house next to the church where Samuel preaches, and we spend a lot of time on church business. I say we. Because they always try to include me in everything they do, so I don't feel so left out and alone. But God, I miss you, Celie. I think about the time you laid yourself down for me. I love you with all my heart. Your sister, Nettie. Next one say. Dearest Celie, by now I am almost crazy. I think Albert told me the truth, and that he is not giving you my letters. The only person I can think of who could help us out is Pa, but I don't want him to know where I am. I asked Samuel if he would visit you and Mister just to see how you are, but he says he can't risk putting himself between man and wife, especially when he don't know them. And I felt bad for having to ask him. He and Corinne have been so nice to me, but my heart is breaking. It is breaking because I cannot find any work in this town, and I will have to leave. After I leave, what will happen to us? How will we ever know what is going on? Corinne and Samuel and the children are part of a group of people called missionaries of the American and African Missionary Society. They have ministered to the Indians out west, and are ministering to the poor of this town. All in preparation for the work they feel they were born for, missionary work in Africa. I dread parting from them, because in the short time we've been together, they've been like family to me, like family might have been. I mean. Write if you can. Here are some stamps. Love, Nettie. Next one, fat. Dated two months later, say. Dear Celie, I wrote a letter to you almost every day on the ship coming to Africa. By the time we docked, I was so down, I tore them into little pieces and dropped them into the water. Albert is not going to let you have my letters, and so what use is there in writing them? That's the way I felt when I tore them up, and sent them to you on the waves. But now. I feel different. I remember one time you said your life made you feel so ashamed. You could even talk about it to God. You had to write it, bad as you thought your writing was. Well, now I know what you meant, and whether God will read letters or no, I know you will go on writing them, which is guidance enough for me. Anyway, when I don't write to you, I feel as bad as I do when I don't pray. Locked up in myself, and choking on my own heart. I am so lonely, Celie. 
The reason I am in Africa is because one of the missionaries that was supposed to go with Corrine and Samuel to help with the children and was setting up a school suddenly married a man who was afraid to let her go and refused to come to Africa with her. So there they were, all set to go, with a ticket suddenly available and no missionary to give it to. At the same time, I wasn't able to find a job anywhere around town. But I never dreamed of going to Africa. I never even thought about it as a real place, though Samuel and Corrine and even the children talked about it all the time. Miss Beasley used to say it was a place overrun with savages who didn't wear clothes. Even Corrine and Samuel thought like this at times. But they know a lot more about it than Miss Beasley or any of our other teachers, and besides, they spoke of all the good things they could do for the downtrodden people from whom they sprang. People who need Christ and good medical advice. One day I was in town with Corrine, and we saw the mayor's wife and her maid. The mayor's wife was shopping, going in and out of stores, and her maid was waiting for her on the street and taking the packages. I don't know if you have ever seen the mayor's wife. She looks like a wet cat. And there was her maid, looking like the very last person in the world you'd expect to see waiting on anybody, and in particular not on anybody that looked like that. I spoke, but just speaking to me seemed to make her embarrassed, and she suddenly sort of erased herself. It was the strangest thing, Celie. One minute I was saying howdy, to a living woman. The next minute nothing living was there, only its shape. All that night I thought about it. Then Samuel and Corrine told me what they'd heard about how she got to be the mayor's maid, that she attacked the mayor, and then the mayor and his wife took her from the prison to work in their home. In the morning I started asking questions about Africa, and started reading all the books Samuel and Corrine have on the subject. Did you know there were great cities in Africa, greater than Milledgeville or even Atlanta, thousands of years ago? That the Egyptians who built the pyramids and enslaved the Israelites were colored? That Egypt is in Africa? That the Ethiopia we read about in the Bible meant all of Africa? Well, I read and I read until I thought my eyes would fall out. I read where the Africans sold us because they loved money more than their own sisters and brothers. How we came to America in ships. How we were made to work. I hadn't realized I was so ignorant, Celie. The little I knew about my own self wouldn't have filled a thimble. And to think Miss Beasley always said I was the smartest child she ever taught. But one thing I do thank her for for teaching me to learn for myself by reading and studying and writing a clear hand, and for keeping alive in me somehow the desire to know. So when Corrine and Samuel asked me if I would come with them and help them build a school in the middle of Africa, I said yes, but only if they would teach me everything they knew to make me useful as a missionary, and someone they would not be ashamed to call a friend. They agreed to this condition, and my real education began at that time. They have been as good as their word, and I study everything night and day. Oh, Celie, there are colored people in the world who want us to know, want us to grow and see the light. They are not all mean like Pa and Albert, or beaten down like Ma was. Corrine and Samuel have a wonderful marriage. Their only sorrow in the beginning was that they could not have children. And then, they say, God sent them Olivia and Adam. I wanted to say, God has sent you their sister and aunt, but I didn't. Yes, their children sent by God are your children. Celie. And they are being brought up in love, Christian charity, and awareness of God. 
and now God has sent me to watch over them, to protect and cherish them, to lavish all the love I feel for you on them. It is a miracle, isn't it? And no doubt impossible for you to believe. But on the other hand, if you can believe I am in Africa, and I am, you can believe anything. Your sister, Nettie. The next letter after that one say, Dear Seely, While we were in town, Corrine bought cloth to make me two sets of traveling outfits, one olive green and the other gray. Long gourd skirts and suit jackets to be worn with white cotton blouses and lace-up boots. She also bought me a woman's boater with a checkered band. Although I work for Corrine and Samuel and look after the children, I don't feel like a maid. I guess this is because they teach me and I teach the children and there's no beginning or end to teaching and learning and working. It all runs together. Saying goodbye to our church group was hard, but happy, too. Everyone has such high hopes for what can be done in Africa. Over the pulpit there is a saying, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God. Think what it means that Ethiopia is Africa. All the Ethiopians in the Bible were colored. It had never occurred to me, but when you read the Bible it is perfectly plain if you pay attention only to the words. It is the pictures in the Bible that fool you, the pictures that illustrate the words. All of the people are white, and so you just think all the people from the Bible were white too. But really white white people lived somewhere else during those times. That's why the Bible says that Jesus Christ had hair like lamb's wool. Lamb's wool is not straight, Seely. It isn't even curly. What can I tell you about New York, or even about the train that took us there? We had to ride in the sit-down section of the train, but see that there are beds on trains, and a restaurant, and toilets. The beds come down out of the walls over the tops of the seats and are called berths. Only white people can ride in the beds and use the restaurant, and they have different toilets from colored. One white man on the platform in South Carolina asked us where we were going. We had got off the train to get some fresh air and to dust the grit and dust out of our clothes. When we said Africa, he looked offended and tickled, too. Niggers going to Africa, he said to his wife. Now I have seen everything. When we got to New York, we were tired and dirty, but so excited. Listen, Seeley. New York is a beautiful city, and colored own a whole section of it called Harlem. There are colored people in more fancy motor cars than I thought existed, and living in houses that are finer than any white person's house down home. There are more than a hundred churches, and we went to every one of them, and I stood before each congregation with Samuel and Corrine and the children, and sometimes our mouths just dropped open from the generosity and goodness of those Harlem people's hearts. They live in such beauty and dignity, Seeley. And they give and give and then reach down and give some more when the name Africa is mentioned. They love Africa. They defend it at the drop of a hat. And speaking of hats, if we had passed our hats alone, they would not have been enough to hold all the donations to our enterprise. Even the children dredged up their pennies. Please give these to the children of Africa, they said. They were all dressed so beautifully, too, Seely. I wish you could have seen them. There is a fashion in Harlem now for boys to wear something called knickers, sort of baggy pants fitted tight just below the knee, and for girls to wear garlands of flowers in their hair. They must be the most beautiful children alive. And Adam and Olivia couldn't take their eyes off them. Then there were the dinners we were invited to, the breakfasts, lunches, and suppers. I gained five pounds just from tasting. 
I was too excited to really eat. And all the people have indoor toilets, Celie, and gas or electric lights. Well, we had two weeks of study in the Olinka dialect, which the people in this region speak. Then we were examined by a doctor, colored, and given medical supplies for ourselves and for our host village by the Missionary Society of New York. It is run by white people, and they didn't say anything about caring about Africa, but only about duty. There is already a white woman missionary not far from our village, who has lived in Africa for the past twenty years. She is said to be much loved by the natives, even though she thinks they are an entirely different species from what she calls Europeans. Europeans are white people who live in a place called Europe. That is where the white people down home came from. She says an African daisy and an English daisy are both flowers, but totally different kinds. The man at the society says she is successful because she doesn't coddle her charges. She also speaks their language. He is a white man who looks at us as if we cannot possibly be as good with the Africans as this woman is. My spirit sort of drooped after being at the society. On every wall there was a picture of a white man, somebody called Speak, somebody called Livingston, somebody called Daly, or was it Stanley? I looked for a picture of the white woman, but didn't see one. Samuel looked a little sad, too, but then he perked up and reminded us that there is one big advantage we have. We are not white. We are not Europeans. We are black, like the Africans themselves. And that we and the Africans will be working for a common goal, the uplift of black people everywhere. Your sister, Nettie. Dear Celie, Samuel is a big man. He dresses in black almost all the time, except for his white clerical collar. And he is black. Until you see his eyes, you think he's somber, even mean. But he has the most thoughtful and gentle brown eyes. When he says something, it settles you, because he never says anything off the top of his head, and he's never out to dampen your spirit or to hurt. Corrine is a lucky woman to have him as her husband. But let me tell you about the ship. The ship, called the Malaga, was three stories high, and we had rooms, called cabins, with beds. Oh, Celie, to lie in a bed in the middle of the ocean, and the ocean, Celie, more water than you can imagine in one place. It took us two weeks to cross it. And then we were in England, which is a country full of white people, and some of them very nice and with their own anti-slavery and missionary society. The churches in England were also very eager to help us, and white men and women, who looked just like the ones at home, invited us to their gatherings and into their homes for tea and to talk about our work. Tea, to the English, is really a picnic indoors. Plenty of sandwiches and cookies, and, of course, hot tea. We all use the same cups and plates. Everyone said I seemed very young to be a missionary, but Samuel said that I was very willing, and that, anyway, my primary duties would be helping with the children and teaching a kindergarten class or two. Our work began to seem somewhat clearer in England, because the English have been sending missionaries to Africa and India and China and God knows where all for over a hundred years. And the things they have brought back! We spent a morning in one of their museums, and it was packed with jewels, furniture, fur carpets, swords, clothing, even tombs from all the countries they have been. From Africa, they have thousands of vases, jars, masks, bowls, baskets, statues, and they are all so beautiful, it is hard to imagine that the people who made them don't still exist. 
and yet the English assure us they do not. Although Africans once had a better civilization than the European, though of course even the English do not say this, I get this from reading a man named J. A. Rogers, for several centuries they have fallen on hard times. Hard times is a phrase the English love to use when speaking of Africa. And it is easy to forget that Africa's hard times were made harder by them. Millions and millions of Africans were captured and sold into slavery. You and me, Seely. And whole cities were destroyed by slave-catching wars. Today the people of Africa, having murdered or sold into slavery their strongest folks, are riddled by disease and sunk in spiritual and physical confusion. They believe in the devil and worship the dead. Nor can they read or write. Why did they sell us? How could they have done it? And why do we still love them? These were the thoughts I had as we tramped through the chilly streets of London. I studied England on a map, so neat and serene, and I became hopeful in spite of myself that much good for Africa is possible, given hard work and the right frame of mind. And then we sailed for Africa leaving Southampton, England, on the 24th of July, and arriving in Monrovia, Liberia, on the 12th of September. On the way we stopped in Lisbon, Portugal, and Dakar, Senegal. Monrovia was the last place we were among people we were somewhat used to, since it is an African country that was founded by ex-slaves from America who came back to Africa to live. Had any of their parents or grandparents been sold from Monrovia, I wondered? And what was their feeling, once sold as slaves, now coming back, with close ties to the country that bought them, to rule? Seely, I must stop now. The sun is not so hot now, and I must prepare for the afternoon classes and vesper service. I wish you were with me. Or I with you. My love, your sister, Nettie. Dearest Seely, It was the funniest thing to stop over in Monrovia after my first glimpse of Africa, which was Senegal. The capital of Senegal is Dakar, and the people speak their own language, Senegalese, I guess they would call it and French. They are the blackest people I have ever seen, Seely. They are black like the people we are talking about when we say, so-and-so is blacker than black. He's blue-black. They are so black, Seely, they shine. Which is something else folks down home like to say about real black folks. But Seely, try to imagine a city full of these shining blue-black people wearing brilliant blue robes with designs like fancy quilt patterns, tall, thin, with long necks and straight backs. Can you picture it at all, Seely? Because I felt like I was seeing black for the first time, and Seely, there is something magical about it. Because the black is so black, the eye is simply dazzled. And then there is the shining that seems to come... Really, from moonlight, it is so luminous. But their skin glows even in the sun. But I did not really like the Senegalese I met in the market. They were concerned only with their sale of produce. If we did not buy, they looked through us as quickly as they looked through the white French people who lived there. Somehow I had not expected to see any white people in Africa. But they are here in droves. And not all are missionaries. There are bunches of them in Monrovia, too, and the president, whose last name is Tubman, has some in his cabinet. He also has a lot of white-looking colored men in his cabinet. On our second evening in Monrovia, we had tea at the presidential palace. It looks very much like the American White House, where our president lives, Samuel says. 
The President talked a good bit about his efforts trying to develop the country and about his problems with the natives, who don't want to work to help build the country up. It was the first time I'd heard a black man use that word. I knew that to white people all colored people are natives. But he cleared his throat and said he only meant native to Liberia. I did not see any of these natives in his cabinet, and none of the cabinet members' wives could pass for natives. Compared to them in their silks and pearls, Corrine and I were barely dressed, let alone dressed for the occasion. But I think the women we saw at the palace spent a lot of their time dressing. Still, they looked dissatisfied. Not like the cheery school teachers we saw only by chance, as they herded their classes down to the beach for a swim. Before we left, we visited one of the large cocoa plantations they have. Nothing but cocoa trees as far as the eye can see. And whole villages built right in the middle of the fields. We watched the weary families come home from work, still carrying their cocoa seed buckets in their hands. These double as lunch buckets next day. And sometimes, if they are women, their children on their backs. As tired as they are, they sing, Seely, just like we do at home. Why do tired people sing? I asked Corrine. Too tired to do anything else, she said. Besides, they don't own the cocoa field, Seely. Even President Tubman doesn't own them. People in a place called Holland do. The people who make Dutch chocolate. And there are overseers who make sure the people work hard, who live in stone houses in the corners of the fields. Again, I must go. Everyone is in bed, and I am writing by lamplight, but the light is attracting so many bugs I am being eaten alive. I have bites everywhere, including my scalp and the bottoms of my feet. But did I mention my first sight of the African coast? Something struck in me, in my soul, Seely, like a large bell, and I just vibrated. Corrine and Samuel felt the same, and we kneeled down right on deck and gave thanks to God for letting us see the land for which our mothers and fathers cried and lived and died to see again. Oh, Seely, will I ever be able to tell you all? I dare not ask, I know, but leave it all to God. Your ever-loving sister, Nettie. Dear God, what with being shock, crying, and blowing my nose, and trying to puzzle out words us don't know, it took a long time to read just the first two or three letters. By the time us got up to where she good and settled in Africa, Mr. and Grady come home. Can you handle it? asked Shug. How I'm going to keep from killing him, I say. Don't kill, she say. Nettie be coming home before long. Don't make her have to look at you like us look at Sophia. But it's so hard, I say. While Shug emptied her suitcase and put the letters inside. Hard to be Christ, too say Shug, but he manage. Remember that. Thou shalt not kill, he said, and probably wanted to add on to that, starting with me. He knowed the fools he was dealing with. But Mr. Not Christ, I'm not Christ, I say. You somebody to Nettie, she say, and she be pissed if you change on her while she on her way home. Us here Grady and Mr. in the kitchen. Dishes rattling, safe door open and shut. No, I think I feel better if I kill him, I say. I feel sickish, numb now. No, you won't. Nobody feel better for killing nothing. They feel something is all. That better than nothing. Seely, she say. Nettie not the only one you got to worry about. Say what? I asked. Me, Seely. Think about me a little bit. 
Miss Seeley, if you kill Albert, Grady be all I got left. I can't even stand the thought of that. I laugh, thinking about Grady's big tooths. Make Albert let me sleep with you from now on, while you're here, I say. And somehow or other, she do. Dear God, us sleep like sisters, me and Suge. Much as I still want to be with her, much as I love to look, my titties stay soft, my little button never rise. Now I know I'm dead. But she said, no, just being mad, grief, wanting to kill somebody will make you feel this way. Nothing to worry about. Titties gonna perk up, button gonna rise again. I loves to hug up, period, she say. Snuggle. Don't need nothing else right now. Yeah, I say. Hugging is good. Snuggle. All of it's good. She say, Times like this, lulls, us ought to do something different. Like what? I asked. Well, she say, looking me up and down, let's make you some pants. What I need pants for, I say. I ain't no man. Don't get uppity, she say. But you don't have a dress do nothing for you. You're not made like no dress pattern, neither. I don't know, I say. Mr. Not going to let his wife wear pants. Why not, says Suge. You do all the work round here. It's a scandalous, the way you look out there plowing in a dress. How you keep from falling over it or getting the plow caught in it is beyond me. Yeah, I say. Yeah. And another thing. I used to put on Albert's pants when we was courting. And he one time put on my dress. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. He used to be a lot of fun. Not like now. But he loved to see me in pants. It was like a red flag to a bull. Mm, I say. I could just picture it, and I didn't like it one bit. Well, you know how they is, say Shug. What is going to make them out of, I say? We have to get our hands on somebody's army uniform, says Shug, for practice. That's good, strong material, and free. Jack, I say, Odessa's husband. Okay, she say, and every day we're going to read Nettie's letters and sew. A needle and not a razor in my hand, I think. She don't say nothing else. Just come over to me and hug. Dear God, Now I know Nettie alive, I begin to strut a little bit. Think. When she come home, us leave here, her and me and our two children. What they look like, I wonder. But it's hard to think about them. I feel shame, more than love, to tell the truth. Anyway, is they all right here? Got good sense and all. Shook say children got by incest turned into dunces. Incest part of the devil's plan. But I think about Nettie. It's hot here, Seely, she write. Hotter than July. Hotter than August and July. Hot like cooking dinner on a big stove in a little kitchen in August and July. Hot. Dear Seely, We were met at the ship by an African from the village we are settling in. His Christian name is Joseph. He is short and fat, with hands that seem not to have any bones in them. When he shook my hand, it felt like something soft and damp was falling, and I almost caught it. He speaks a little English, what they call pigeon English. It is very different from the way we speak English, but somehow familiar. He helped us unload our things from the ship into the boats that came out to get us. These boats are really dug-out canoes like the Indians had, the ones you see in pictures. With all our belongings, we filled three of them, and a fourth one carried our medical and teaching supplies. 
Once in the boat, we were entertained by the songs of our boatmen as they tried to outpaddle each other to the shore. They paid very little attention to us or our cargo. When we reached the shore, they didn't bother to help us alight from the boat, and actually set some of our supplies right down in the water. As soon as they had browbeat poor Samuel out of a tip that Joseph said was too big, they were off hallooing another group of people who were waiting at the edge of the water to be taken to the ship. The port is pretty, but too shallow for large ships to use, so there is a good business for the boatmen during the season the ships come by. These boatmen were all considerably larger and more muscular than Joseph though all of them, including Joseph, are a deep chocolate brown, not black like the Senegalese. And Seely, they all have the strongest, cleanest, whitest teeth. I was thinking about teeth a lot on the voyage over, because I had toothache nearly the entire time. You know how rotten my back teeth are. And in England, I was struck by the English people's teeth. So crooked, usually and blackish with decay. I wondered if it was the English water. But the African's teeth remind me of horses' teeth. They are so fully formed, straight, and strong. The port's town is the size of the hardware store in town. Inside there are stalls filled with cloth, hurricane lamps and oil, mosquito netting, camp bedding, hammocks, axes, and hoes and machetes and other tools. The whole place is run by a white man, but some of the stalls that sell produce are rented out to Africans. Joseph showed us things we needed to buy. A large iron pot for boiling water and our clothes, a zinc basin, mosquito netting, nails, hammer and saw and pickaxe, oil and lamps. Since there was nowhere to sleep in the port... Joseph hired some porters from among the young men loafing around the trading post, and we left right away for Olinka, some four days' march through the bush. Jungle to you. Or maybe not. Do you know what a jungle is? Well, trees and trees and then more trees on top of that, and big. They are so big they look like they were built and vines and ferns and little animals, frogs, snakes too, according to Joseph. But thank God we did not see any of these, only humpback lizards, as big as your arm, which the people here catch and eat. They love meat, all the people in this village. Sometimes if you can't get them to do anything any other way, you start to mention meat, either a little piece extra you just happen to have, or maybe if you want them to do something big, you talk about a barbecue. Yes, a barbecue. They remind me of folks at home. Well, we got here, and I thought I would never get the kinks out of my hips from being carried in a hammock the whole way. Everybody in the village crowded round us, coming out of little round huts with something that I thought was straw on top of them, but it's really a kind of leaf that grows everywhere. They pick it and dry it, and lay it so it overlaps to make the roof rainproof. This part is women's work. Men folks drive the stakes for the hut and sometimes help build the walls with mud and rock from the streams. You never saw such curious faces as the village folks surrounded us with. At first they just looked. Then one or two of the women touched my and Corinne's dresses. My dress was so dirty round the hem from dragging on the ground for three nights of cooking round a campfire that I was ashamed of myself. But then I took a look at the dresses they were wearing. Most looked like they'd been drug across the yard by the pigs. And they don't fit. So then they moved up a little bit, nobody saying a word yet, and touched our hair. Then looked down at our shoes. We looked at Joseph. Then he told us they were acting this way because the missionaries before us were white people, and vice versa. The men had been to the port, some of them, and had seen the white merchant, so they knew white men could be something else, too. But the women had never been to the port, and the only white person they'd seen 
was the missionary they had buried a year ago. Samuel asked if they had ever seen the white woman missionary twenty miles farther on, and he said no. Twenty miles through the jungle is a very long trip. The men might hunt up to ten miles around the village, but the women stayed close to their huts and fields. Then one of the women asked a question. We looked at Joseph. He said, The woman wanted to know if the children belonged to me or to Corrine or to both of us. Joseph said they belonged to Corrine. The woman looked us both over and said something else. We looked at Joseph. He said, the woman said, they both looked like me. We all laughed politely. Then another woman had a question. She wanted to know if I was also Samuel's wife. Joseph said, no, that I was a missionary just like Samuel and Corrine. Then someone said they never suspected missionaries could have children. Then another said he never dreamed missionaries could be black. Then someone said that the new missionaries would be black, and two of them women, was exactly what he had dreamed, and just last night, too. By now there was a lot of commotion. Little heads began to pop from behind mother's skirts and over big sister's shoulders and we were sort of swept along among the villages, about three hundred of them, to a place without walls, but with a leaf roof, where we all sat down on the ground, men in front, women and children behind. Then there was loud whispering among some very old men who looked like the church elders back home, with their baggy trousers and shiny, ill-fitting coats, did black missionaries drink palm wine? Corrine looked at Samuel, and Samuel looked at Corrine, but me and the children were already drinking it, because someone had already put the little brown clay glasses in our hands, and we were too nervous not to start sipping. We got there around four o'clock, and sat under the leaf canopy until nine. We had our first meal there a chicken and ground nut, peanut, stew, which we ate with our fingers. But mostly we listened to songs and watched dances that raised lots of dust. The biggest part of the welcoming ceremony was about the roof leaf, which Joseph interpreted for us as one of the villagers recited the story that it is based upon. The people of this village think they have always lived on the exact spot where their village now stands, and this spot has been good to them. They plant cassava fields that yield huge crops. They plant groundnuts that do the same. They plant yam and cotton and millet, all kinds of things. But once, a long time ago, one man in the village wanted more than his share of land to plant. He wanted to make more crops so as to use his surplus for trade with the white men on the coast. Because he was chief at the time, he gradually took more and more of the common land and took more and more wives to work it. As his greed increased, he also began to cultivate the land on which the roof leaf grew. Even his wives were upset by this and tried to complain, but they were lazy women and no one paid any attention to them. Nobody could remember a time when roof leaf did not exist in overabundant amounts. But eventually, the greedy chief took so much of this land that even the elders were disturbed. So he simply bought them off with axes and cloth and cooking pots that he got from the coast traders. But then there came a great storm during the rainy season that destroyed all the roofs on all the huts in the village, and the people discovered to their dismay that there was no longer any roof leaf to be found. Where roof leaf had flourished from time's beginning, there was cassava, millet, groundnuts. For six months the heavens and the winds abused the people of Olinka. 
Rain came down in spears, stabbing away the mud of their walls. The wind was so fierce it blew the rocks out of the walls and into the people's cooking pots. Then cold rocks, shaped like millet balls, fell from the sky, striking everyone, men and women and children alike, and giving them fevers. The children fell ill first, then their parents. Soon the village began to die. By the end of the rainy season, half the village was gone. The people prayed to their gods and waited impatiently for the seasons to change. As soon as the rain stopped, they rushed to the old roof-leaf beds and tried to find the old roots. But of the endless numbers that had always grown there, only a few dozen remained. It was five years before the roof-leaf became plentiful again. During those five years, many more in the village died. Many left, never to return. Many were eaten by animals. Many, many were sick. The chief was given all his store-bought utensils and forced to walk away from the village forever. His wives were given to other men. On the day when all the huts had roofs again from the roof leaf, the villagers celebrated by singing and dancing and telling the story of the roof leaf. The roof leaf became the thing they worshipped. Looking over the heads of the children at the end of this tale, I saw coming slowly towards us a large, brown, spiky thing as big as a room, with a dozen legs walking slowly and carefully under it. When it reached our canopy, it was presented to us. It was our roof. As it approached, the people bowed down. The white missionary before you would not let us have this ceremony, said Joseph, but the Olinka like it very much. We know a roof leaf is not Jesus Christ, but in its own humble way. Is it not God? So there we sat, Seely, face to face with the Olinka God. And Seely, I was so tired and sleepy and full of chicken and groundnut stew, my ears ringing with song, that all that Joseph said made perfect sense to me. I wonder what you will make of all this. I send my love, your sister, Nettie. Dear Seely, it has been a long time since I had time to write, but always, no matter what I'm doing, I'm writing to you. Dear Seely, I say in my head in the middle of vespers, the middle of the night, while cooking, Dear, dear Seely. And I imagine that you really do get my letters, and that you are writing me back. Dear Nettie, this is what life is like for me. We are up at five o'clock for a light breakfast of millet porridge and fruit and the morning classes. We teach the children English, reading, writing, history, geography, arithmetic, and the stories of the Bible. At eleven o'clock we break for lunch and household duties. From one until four it is too hot to move, though some of the mothers sit behind their huts and sew. At four o'clock we teach the older children, and at night we are available for adults. Some of the older children are used to coming to the mission school, but the smaller ones are not. Their mothers sometimes drag them here, screaming and kicking. They are all boys. Olivia is the only girl. The Olinka do not believe girls should be educated. When I asked a mother why she thought this, she said, a girl is nothing to herself. Only to her husband can she become something. What can she become, I ask? Why, she said, the mother of his children. But I am not the mother of anybody's children, I said, and I am something. You are not much, she said, the missionary's drudge. 
It is true that I work harder here than I ever dreamed I could work, and that I sweep out the school and tidy up after service, but I don't feel like a drudge. I was surprised that this woman, whose Christian name is Catherine, saw me in this light. She has a little girl, Tashi, who plays with Olivia after school. Adam is the only boy who will speak to Olivia at school. They are not mean to her. It is just, what is it? Because she is where they are doing boys' things, they do not see her. But never fear, Seely. Olivia has your stubbornness and clear-sightedness, and she is smarter than all of them, including Adam, put together. Why can't Tashi come to school? she asked me. When I told her the Olinka don't believe in educating girls, she said, quick as a flash, they're like white people at home who don't want colored people to learn. Oh, she's sharp, Seely. At the end of the day, when Tashi can get away from all the chores her mother assigns her, she and Olivia secret themselves in my hut, and everything Olivia has learned she shares with Tashi. To Olivia right now, Tashi alone is Africa. The Africa she came beaming across the ocean hoping to find. Everything else is difficult for her. The insects, for instance. For some reason, all of her bites turn into deep, runny sores, and she has a lot of trouble sleeping at night because the noises from the forest frighten her. It is taking a long time for her to become used to the food, which is nourishing, but for the most part, indifferently prepared. The women of the village take turns cooking for us, and some are cleaner and more conscientious than others. Olivia gets sick from the food prepared by any of the chief's wives. Samuel thinks it may be the water they use, which comes from a separate spring that runs clear even in the dry season. But the rest of us have no ill effects. It is as if Olivia fears the food from these wives because they all look so unhappy and work so hard. Whenever they see her, they talk about the day when she will become their litless sister wife. It is just a joke, and they like her, but I wish they wouldn't say it. Even though they are unhappy and work like donkeys, they still think it is an honor to be the chief's wife. He walks around all day holding his belly up and talking and drinking palm wine with the healer. Why do they say I will be a wife of the chief? asked Olivia. That is as high as they can think, I tell her. He is fat and shiny, with huge, perfect teeth. She thinks she has nightmares about him. You will grow up to be a strong Christian woman, I tell her, someone who helps her people to advance. You will be a teacher or a nurse. You will travel. You will know many people greater than the chief. Will Tashi? She wants to know. Yes, I tell her. Tashi, too. Corrine said to me this morning, Nettie, to stop any kind of confusion in the minds of these people, I think we should call one another brother and sister all the time. Some of them can't seem to get it through their thick skulls that you are not Samuel's other wife. I don't like it, she said. Almost since the day we arrived, I've noticed a change in Corrine. She isn't sick. She works as hard as ever. She is still sweet and good-natured. But sometimes I sense her spirit is being tested, and that something in her is not at rest. That's fine, I said. I'm glad you brought it up. And don't let the children call you Mama Nettie, she said, even in play. This bothered me a little, but I didn't say anything. The children do call me Mama Nettie sometimes because I do a good bit of fussing over them. But I never try to take Corrine's place. And another thing, she said. I think we ought to try not to borrow each other's clothes. Well, she never borrowed anything of mine because I don't have much. But I'm all the time borrowing something of hers. You feeling yourself? I asked her. 
She said, yes. I wish you could see my hut, Celie. I love it. Unlike our school, which is square, and unlike our church, which doesn't have walls, at least during the dry season, my hut is round, walled, with a round roof-leaf roof. -leaf roof. 